maker spaces come in various forms. Um, some are commercial, some are community based, but it is a venue or place where people can come together and create, design, produce um, items, concepts, designs, uh, often with shared equipment and material. And some of those are going to be for personal use. Uh, some of them are for um, actual uh, products that people are selling. Adelaide Makerspace offers a range of uh, services. So we have, for example, a textile room with uh, sewing machines and overlockers, as well as, again, a skill set of people that are in there that try to support people's projects and ideas. We have the digital fabrication area, which involves the laser cutting and 3D printing aspects of the space. We have an electronics room. We then have the space which we're currently sitting in, which is the workshop area, and that is uh, mainly consistent of large uh, woodworking machines and also metalworking. The circular economy is a way of operating where we reduce the amount of natural resources that we need and also reduce the amount of waste that's produced by keeping materials in use as long as possible. This is different to the current linear economy where we take items from the natural resources, we make goods, we use them and then dispose of them in landfill. The world has a waste problem where we're filling our world up with landfill, 300 million tonnes of plastic. Uh, is disposed of each year, which is the weight of the human population. We're also running out of resources. The world has to move from a linear economy to a circular economy. The current linear economy is just not sustainable. So every year, South Australia is diverting about 4 million tonnes away from landfill, and that's a huge amount of material and if you put that into context each year South Australia generates 5 million tonnes so talking about about 80% of material doesn't actually go to landfill it gets turned into useful products like recycled products such as compost, um, recycled plastics, paper cardboard, even recycled building materials like concrete. Our e-waste gets recycled so all the electronic components as well. We're very good at measuring recycling, so typically we look at the tons of material, what type of material they are, and whether it's recycled or sent to landfill, so that's quite easy to measure. You just need a set of scales for that. But when it comes to measuring reuse or repairability, there's no standard way to go about that. It's actually really, really challenging. So this is something that businesses looking to move to the circular economy are grappling with. It's something they're uh, grappling with here in the makerspace. How do they actually measure the contributions of preventing waste from occurring. I've noticed there's a whole range of different faces in the room. I'm excited that we have people from the industry. So at the back, we've got um, YCA Recycling, Plastics Recyclers in SA. We have someone from IKEA. We have someone from Sage Automation. We have people from Reuse, Repair, Recycling Spaces, from the universities, academics, and councils, and many more. So it's great to have such a range of different people. And we're going to need all your smarts today because we're tackling a massive challenge. How do you measure repairability? How do you measure waste that has been avoided? This is something that's a challenge not just for South Australia, but for governments and businesses around the world. They're looking about how do we actually do this challenge. So today we've got a series of, of workshops. We've got a morning session and an afternoon session. And we're going to be looking at four different product types based on their material. So we're going to be looking out there in the woodworking sections at wood products, mostly furniture. In this room here, we're going to have two groups working. One are going to be on textiles and the other is going to be on plastics. And in that room over there, we're going to get to the electronics. So we're going to be breaking down things like computers and um, mobile phones. We're going to actually assess and manually disassemble the items. Then we're going to look at them for how repairable is it? Now, is it repairable by the average person? Or do you have to be a specialist to repair it? Or do we even know if it's repairable? This is the questions that we're going to be asking. And what I'm expecting today 
is that a lot of the answers we won't know, and that's a finding in itself. That's just something that we have to, to come to terms with. A lot of products at the moment are not circular. There's a lot of lacking information on products. We don't know if they can be repaired. We don't know if they can be recycled. And that's going to be a finding in itself. So the ultimate goal of today is to be able to put a framework around what contributions the makerspaces make for the circular economy. So how do we actually measure the contribution? And so part of that is measuring uh, things that can be more readily quantified, such as the quantity of materials or the count of the number of items that are repaired or reused, as well as their associated environmental values for, for example, greenhouse gas emissions or water savings as well as the economic and financial value of rescuing those materials. So that's one side. And then the other side, which is even harder to measure, of what are the social benefits of the makerspace? The things that are much harder to measure, such as education, a sense of community, and building in the values of repairability, reusability, and longevity of products into the thinking of the next generation of designers. Um, so we actually did the booster chair um, because pretty much it is mostly a plastic product. It's actually analysing and looking at what components firstly could you uh, repurpose or recycle. Um, and so things like the covers, you could actually use those in ways of creating maybe some sort of bag or pouch. So you could use them for electronics, things like that, because it's already got um, the padding inside. It's, most people were at the table going, I don't, uh, don't know what we're going to do with it, like, other than it go into general waste. So you have the synthetic fibres, but then if they've got glues involved, then that suddenly complicates the whole, the whole process as well. Um, again, things like this backing. It is actually recyclable. Um, uh, if you hadn't got two pieces that were glued together. Um, there are certain safety standards around this product, so at the end of its life, it does have an end-of-use life. And so from there, the most likely thing is that you actually can you know, get it chipped up and turned into a new plastic product. I know I've got like a computer bag that has frayed straps. You could actually use that as a new um, strap for putting over your shoulder or putting as handles. These things are sitting in people's garages, not knowing that, you know, is there a deposit place that you can go and drop it off to get it repurposed, recycled, reused? Uh, we had a hardwood table, so it was um, hinged so it could fold flat, so you could lean it up against a wall or a cane flat packed. So um, we had a look, it was very easy to disassemble uh, up to a point. So we were able to get the legs separated um, and off and take the small pieces of wood off, but the actual tabletop itself was glued together and had some um, wooden dowels and things in. So it could be pulled apart, but maybe with a certain skill set. Yeah. The makers were very confident that they could repair this piece without any trouble, but in terms of whether or not, um, you know, just your general person, general lay person would know mm -hmm how to repair it, they, it would be general. I think we said a seven out of 10 that it was repairable. Uh, as far as recyclability, it, we, it was a hardwood, but what we couldn't tell was what type. We couldn't tell how it had been treated. We didn't know if it was had any toxic chemicals or things like that in it. So we were doubtful that it could get recycled with somewhere like Jeffrey's. We disassembled a one of those cube units. It was, we found it was made out of um, some MDF particle board with some nails and the wooden dowels. Um, we weren't too sure where it was made. It had none of the, the markings on it um, for any of that sort of stuff. It took us about seven minutes to disassemble. It was pretty easy. For repairability, we thought that the average person could repair something like this even after they've disassembled it and if it was broken. And you can paint it instead of gluing um, plastic laminates, um, which, which made us unsure how to recycle it. If it was just wood, we would you know, maybe throw it in the green bin. But um, because of these things that aren't easily removable, um, mm -hmm. we weren't sure what to do with it really. Yeah. So we did the electronics and I have never disassembled a computer in my life. 
So I was watching eagerly, watching the group eagerly. So we had actually, I think we had five laptops, so each person had their own laptop and was using um, screwdrivers, believe it or not, to disassemble it, so we didn't need any specialist equipment. The more modern day laptops are getting smaller and smaller and lighter and lighter, which means that they're soldering on the components so you can't just manually disassemble and replace anymore. So the circularity of electronic items, they're potentially becoming less circular over time. But what we actually found was the parts that the person could actually repair themselves was more accessible, that would make it a lot easier. Because at the moment, a lot of things you have to actually undo, look for it and try and repair it yourself. So it should be designed in a manner that um, a person can make those changes if they want to increase a hard drive or they want to change over the battery or other components. We worked out that a lot of the parts of the phone were recyclable, but there was a lot of um, a lot of issues around like knowing where to recycle them, knowing whether small components can be recycled as is, and I guess also a little bit of doubt over whether it can be properly recycled and whether the effort of disassembling the phone is going to result in all those little parts being recycled. Yeah, for batteries, there's like obviously phone recycling places that you can drop those parts off. Um, some things like plastics probably could be put into just normal plastic recycling. Um, and then there were a couple of components like the motherboards and stuff that we probably would usually just be chucked out, I guess. But yeah, for the most part, phones weren't too bad for recycling as long as you knew where to go. We had one of these old uh, travel bags. Um, sadly, because it's made from such cheap materials, it's really hard to strip back and, um, and recycle, uh, mainly because it's got um, cheap fabric that's been um, fused together with EVA foam. Yeah, it's got a very high like effort to recycle. Most of it would be going into landfill, sadly. Um, but in terms of what we can recycle was mainly the frame and maybe the zippers if you really wanted to salvage them. But the frame is metal frame um, with separate wheels. In the concept of the makerspace, like we could probably um, strip that completely off and reuse it, turn it into like a small carry trolley or even fit it to another bag to turn it into a travel bag. So it went for an actual jacket this time. So you can see I've pulled apart the internal, like say so the lining and the sleeves off of it. Um, good thing about this is because it's a jacket, like most clothing, it's actually um, almost 100% reusable um, or recyclable or um, uh, repairable. Um, basically, yeah, if you get a rip in this, or you get a, um, any sort of damage, you can patch it or sew it up. Basically what we said is there's like repair jobs and there's um, like renewing it. And obviously making it look like new or clo as close to it as you can takes a bit more specialist um, uh, knowledge. But obviously if you're just repairing it, it's kind of just basic, basic knowledge of how to sew or um, how to patch. And with iron on patches or something like that. Um, in terms of reusing it, um, because it's material and it's, it is cotton, um, it has like 5% spandex in there it was, yeah. It's still a nice material so you could de-stitch it and reuse sections. It was very easy to get to the seams. Most manufacturers really clog up the edges of um, all the seams um, or like in that bag they'll, they'll um, put other fabric over top of the seam so then it's like extra layer to get off whereas this was just a matter of taking out the inner lining you could unstitch it um, so if it were to split down a seam it'd be easy to, 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 to patch up as well the only notable thing was the the buttons because they're custom it boils down to the same thing of obviously if you're repairing it you can easily get a new button for it but it won't match if you were going to go a bit deeper and try and repair it to new you'd probably replace all of them so then they obviously would all match. So one of my takeaways from today is the importance of legislation and standards. In order to make these materials recyclable, it gets very complicated when you're putting that decision down to the consumer to make the decision to repair something or have to go out of their way to fix something. But if you can make a systems change, 
by putting the burden on the supplier to actually take responsible for the longevity of that product and to move to more service-based models rather than product ownership models, then we're much more likely to overcome this challenge about circularity and, and moving to a more circular economy. In terms of other lessons from today, I learned it's very fun to <laughs> break down a laptop and I think a lot of people gained the confidence and skills that it's not so hard to, to try to repair things. And it was really great to be able to demonstrate the value of the makerspace in providing a safe and open and welcome environment to encourage people to, to actually repair things rather than simply dispose or recycle them. Makerspaces should be circular because circular economy is not a nice to have, it's a must have. Uh, we are using up all our natural resources and we're creating a lot of waste. The role of a makerspace can use products that are already in train uh, and create a second life for those products. We're hoping that the, the actual tool that comes out of this will actually allow us to have a tangible measurement of what's going on, it's of how we can know as a group if we're going along the right path of succeeding in our goals for, for the circular economy in this space. Being able to show that, that path, that life of where's it come from and track it to where it's going to, um, or what's it become. Um, that's the kind of thing we're hoping this tool is going to guide us towards. How do we as a community group measure those outcomes? Um, and from today, having, again, a community of people putting input into it um, helps us get closer to that goal. The challenges that we set our participants today are really big challenges and we know that because the solutions don't already exist for tackling big questions like how do you measure avoided consumption? How do you measure repairability? So for me, one of the takeaways is, is this is just the beginning of a journey, um, but we expect that there's probably going to be a lot of iterations on this and, and this, this space and, and this initiative is very much an open collaborative one. So we really encourage people to stay networking, stay sharing, because um, together I think we can really come up with a, a framework that's practical and be able to measure the contribution of spaces like this one. Mm -hmm.